Um, I'm Barbara Norman, for those who don't know me. I'm the Director of Canberra Urban and Regional Futures uh, at the University. And it's my great pleasure to uh, welcome our guest speaker uh, to the University. But before I do that uh, more formally, uh, it's our tradition here at the University, as it should be, to acknowledge the Ngunnawal's peoples as the traditional custodians of the land upon which the University's main campus sits and pay respects to all elders past and present. So uh, our international seminar, our, it's our third or fourth, we're having a busy year this year. And uh, um, so um, I'm delighted to uh, welcome Brent Todorian, Todorian, there we are, I should have checked that before. And uh, from Todorian Urban Works, who uh, uh, really brings a wealth of experience on uh, place-based development. And I'm very quickly scanning to see uh, who's here. I've got MLAs, I can see, um, and uh, Dean Linden, and uh, so a variety of people here, which is fantastic. Um, uh, but place-based development is something that is critical to everyone's uh, heart in this city. And I know that uh, uh, the ACT government has some very significant projects coming very soon. Uh, connected with light rail redevelopment. I see Tony Carmichael very much involved in that. And uh, the redevelopment of the, the land on uh, the side, uh, city to the lake, uh, just here on this campus. Very, very significant program over the next 10 years. And uh, connected with that, of course, is the whole area of Belconnen. So it's extremely timely to have you come and speak. And uh, so we look forward to this. I think you're going to do an ABC uh, interview after this. So um, maybe some of the questions might stimulate your thinking. Uh, and just one last thing, of course. Uh, our Vice Chancellor, Deep Saini, uh, was at your university, Waterloo, where you graduated. So I think that's a really nice connection between uh, this university and Canada. So it's a small world. So thank you, Trent. And we, uh, Brent, I look forward to uh, hearing your talk. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, my voice hopefully will hold up. I've had a, a, a flu uh, and, uh, and um, a vocal challenge, if you will, for as long as I've been in Australia this trip, which has really reinforced for me how much my voice is my instrument. So um, I've been powering through, uh, but you might start to note a bit of cracking right near the end. So it's a good thing we're probably going to just try to have me go about 30 minutes as opposed to how long I normally take. But I'll warn you, I probably got an hour's worth of slides in this talk, so I'm going to skip past various things. Uh, if you see something flash by that looked really, really interesting, I'm sorry. I just don't have the time to cover it all. Um, I am going to be talking, uh, I noted the uh, explanation outside said I was going to be talking, I think, about placemaking. You can pretty much um, give uh, my talks any title you, you'd like, but, but what I tend to talk about is how we can design, plan better cities that are more sustainable, healthier, uh, more climate friendly, etc and certainly more livable. Uh, I use Vancouver as a case study because I was chief planner there for six years, but I've been out of that post for five years now and I work in some of the most uh, progressive and aspirational cities around the world. So I increasingly draw from those cities as well. So uh, I am gonna talk about livable cities and um, uh, this is the moment where I brag a bit for, for, to the benefit of our mutual countries. If you believe in the methodology of The Economist magazine, for example, which I tend to take with a massive grain of salt, but um, our two countries are doing fairly well. Seven out of ten of the top ten most livable cities in the world, according to Economist magazine, are in Australia and Canada. And I suspect that's just alphabetical, but they gave you top billing. Uh, if you add your regional um, neighbor, uh, Auckland, there are actually eight out of the top ten. So our two countries, our cities, are doing fairly well if you um, go by the uh, economist methodology. But it, what we find in Vancouver is that there are a surprising number of ways that cities can get attention once you get on a roll. And Vancouver is definitely an it city in the context of being ranked for just about anything. You know, even things like top coffee city, which tends to make me scratch my head and laugh because I work in cities that really love their coffee compared to Vancouver. But one of the most interesting is the second one, most reputable, one of the most reputable cities in the world in terms of a city brand. A perception of the city um, 
from the world, which I don't need to tell you is a pretty big asset. You know, things like livability are subjective. How people in other parts of the world perceive your city is powerful. But all sorts of ways. And my point is everything I'm going to talk about in terms of a city by design, which is what we call ourselves in Vancouver, and designing for a better city with better outcomes is completely in keeping with all of these various measurements of success, the most important one being economically successful city. None of this is warm and fuzzy, where we are doing things to make us feel good at the expense of our economic success. And I say that because I often speak in so-called conservative cities. This is all good for business, if that happens to be what pushes your buttons. At some point though, and I always say this because uh, even in some of the most progressive cities in the world, I tend to be amazed at the strength of the culture of excuse. I comment that uh, at some point in my talk, many of you will still be thinking, even as progressive an audience as you no doubt are, uh, you'll still be thinking what I call the eight most unhelpful words in the English language, which is we could never do that in our city. And maybe you don't want to do some of the things that I show you in your city. Uh, something that comes to mind are tall buildings, for example. But I'm here to tell you there are good ways to do things and bad ways to do things, no matter how tall, for example, your building is. And I'll get into that a little later. What I find in working for, as I say, some of the most aspirational cities in the world, is that the cities that are doing remarkable and even Herculean things, compared to the cities that are resting on their laurels, and maybe doing just a little bit better than they have been in the past, is a combination of what I call vision, will, and skill. The vision's the easy part. It's the will and skill, the ability to actually get it done and stop talking about it. And the skill sets involved with delivering things that really are differentiating cities. It's not your climate, it's not your topography, it's not your government or legal structure and your powers under your planning act. All of those are excuses. The cities that are getting things done are the cities that are forcing things to be done in a positive way. And as an example of that, people think I talk about progressive cities because I planned for Vancouver. Well, before I planned for Vancouver, I planned for another Canadian city, Calgary, Canada. And this is considered the most right-wing, conservative, American-like, Texan-like city in Canada. And those aren't compliments, by the way. Uh, this is a pro-business, dollars and cents, business case kind of city. And yet they're doing remarkable things around urban design and city making. They're doing it because of the business case, not because of the warm and fuzzy of quality of life and some of the intangibles, which I happen to value greatly because not everything that counts can be counted. But my point is, when I was in Calgary, I pushed the business case button because that's how I got politicians, so-called right-wing conservative politicians, to support the kinds of things that I think we would all want to happen. I am merciless in my willingness to push whatever button is necessary with whatever political audience I am faced that will convince them and be more persuasive with them instead of trying to make every politician value the same things that I value. That's a recipe for urbanistic failure. So as an example, Calgary, just recently approved the largest downtown separated cycle track bike lane pilot that had ever been done in Canada. They learned from the mistake we made in Vancouver because we were building separated bike lanes one at a time. I called it pulling the band-aid off slowly. It drove me crazy because every time we would do a bike lane, I would be the one who would go to the media and answer the question, why aren't there cyclists in the bike lane? Well, because we don't have a complete network. Are we done now? No, of course we're not done. We only have one bike lane. We don't have a complete network. And I got sick of having that conversation as we did bike lanes one at a time. If you're going to do a pilot if, and show that bike lanes work, you have to do a complete network. To their credit, uh, the um, Council for City of Calgary just, per, just voted to make this permanent. And again, this is a cul car culture place, a place that at least the narrative was that it's a pro-car city, a narrative I hear a lot in Australian cities. It's part of your culture to love cars. I gotta tell you, I don't buy that. It surprises me. Um, I note how often culture overlaps with design. You design a city entirely for the car, and then you claim that there's a car culture here. Well, any sane person would drive a car in a city that's designed for cars. 
Is that culture? Or is that just rational response to what you've been building? What I find is that in so-called car culture cities, if you design for bikes, transit, and walking exceptionally well, surprise, surprise, culture changes. And rational people make rational decisions, particularly the millennials, and I'll get to that in a minute. So uh, I'm here on behalf of the Hart Foundation. I talk about many different reasons why we're having a fundamentally different conversation about the way we build our cities and our suburbs. And I'm a bit nervous about using the kind of language like, uh, our city is making us fat, or our city is making us sick, because I'm not an environmental determinist. I don't believe a causal relationship exists between these things, but I do believe that we can design places that are a barrier to physio physical activity or a helper. And we've been doing more of the former than the latter. And certainly in my experience, your city of Canberra so far uh, makes it very hard to be physically active, unless of course you're driving to the gym to do some exercise on a fake walking thing. So, and then you're not alone in that way. You're not uh, unique to that. But this is powerful. The medical health care professionals have become an incredibly powerful ally in the conversation of, for people like me about a better designed city and a better designed suburbs. As an example, this is the four top public health care officials in the four regions surrounding Toronto in Canada. And they held a joint press conference. And what they said was, build more walkable, bikeable, and transit-friendly communities as the primary method of disease prevention, preventable disease avoidance. And they got a ton of press. I joke that if the four top city planners in the four regions called a press conference, the media wouldn't have come. But they came because the doctors called. We're trained to listen to our doctors more than we're trained to listen to our city planners. So they are an incredibly powerful ally, and yes, I'm here on behalf, this is my second trip on behalf of uh, the uh, Hart Foundation, where I'm being put in rooms with state planners, state elected officials, local council planners, and working with them on better plans, better designs. And my client is not the state governments or the local councils, it's the Hart Foundation. I think that's pretty cool. My Canadian Hart Foundation is not doing that. That's a pretty cool thing that your Australian Heart Foundation is doing. And you're doing great documents too. I, I, was, I, I, so, I, I don't put this slide up because I'm sucking up to my host. This is in my PowerPoint presentation all over the world. And I tell people you can download this and you should. And you can read it. But I'll give away the ending. Yes, density matters. Density matters in almost everything I'm going to talk about. And yes, uh, I'm glad to be in a place where they take climate change seriously. I was just in an Australian city where the mayor is technically still a climate change denier. There used to be a lot of climate change denial in the United States until Hurricane Sandy was a game changer. And this headline was put out at the time, it's global warming stupid, which I now think, uh, even though it was done in the past, is now speaking directly to America's current president. But you can just as easily make the connections between how we're building cities and suburbs and climate change although the public isn't necessarily geared to listen to climate scientists as well as you are geared to listen to, to your doctors. So I'm constantly looking for the most persuasive source. What I've settled on recently is the fiscal math. Canadian cities are in the lead. Australian cities are starting to go this route because I've been coming and working with you for five years and I beat this like a drum when I come. But cities are doing the math on the costs of infill versus suburbs. 60, 40, 70, 30, 90, 10, infill versus greenfield development. Go in that direction in the cane lands in Gold Coast, for example, or that direction where it's drier. Billions of dollars of difference in public health care costs over the life of a plan. This is a small Canadian city, Halifax, uh, on the East Coast, changing the growth projections from 60, from 50-50 to 60-40, infill to greenfields, $3 billion of difference over the life of a plan. Whether you are a right-wing politician or a left-wing politician, $3 billion gets your attention. You can't unknow this once uh, this bell has been rung. And I'm finding this is the most powerful uh, motivator for a different conversation. This is changing suburbia. 
Cities and suburbs are changing fast now, I'm finding. In Canada, increasingly in other places. Not because of the ideology of urbanists like me. Because we're doing better math. And we're showing that cities are literally bankrupting themselves. Building on infrastructure. And by the way, if your land development industry is telling you they're paying for the infrastructure, they're not. Not even close to the upfront initial capital costs, let alone the soft costs, the operating budgets, the full and life cycle costs. Not even close. And you don't even have to count things like the um, externalities, like public health care costs and climate change. Not even close. The good news is the demographics are helping us. The millennials, and I don't overstate this because there's a lot of overly simplistic statements being made about the millennials, but a good portion of the millennials, about half, have a completely different perspective on the car. They don't want a suburban experience that's car oriented. They treat the smartphone like previous generations treated the car in terms of equating it with freedom. They're foregoing their driver's license. Not all millennials, but half which is a lot more than any previous generation. So the largest demographic group on planet Earth, the millennials, it used to be the boomers, but some of the aging boomers are starting to pass away. The millennials just passed the boomers for being the largest. And these are the people who are the producers of work now. So every city is trying to attract the millennials because the boomers are going to start getting into the drawing from the system instead of contributing to the system ages. So it's the cities that attract the, the millennials are the ones that are going to win. And they want urban places or they want suburbs where walking, biking, and transit are a reasonable option. And they'll pick places that provide that. Their parents, the baby boomers, forgive me if you're offended. I hope nobody's offended by this term. It's not my term. It's the Wall Street Journal's term. But yes, I'm shamelessly repeating it. The broken hipsters, they called them the baby boomers, and they call them that because the so-called aging boomers are acting like the millennials, or the boomers, or sorry, the, um, uh, the hipsters were supposed to be acting. They're picking urban places that are not car dependent, that are close to where their kids and grandkids can live. They don't want to be in seniors enclaves, and they want to be able to walk to things because they are staying more active than previous generations ever have into their later years. So the lot. The, this, the other largest demographic group in human history, and by the way, the ones with all the money who are outbidding their kids for the real estate are interested in urban places and walkable suburbs. So the two largest demographic groups in human history want what I'm talking about. So the question is, why aren't we building it? The demographic group in between, the households that are having families, the narrative is usually that they as soon as they start to have kids, want to move to the suburbs. It's true if you design your urban places to virtually repel families, which is what we've been doing up till now. But in Vancouver, we have 7,000 children in our downtown peninsula, which is about 6,800 more than we had a few decades ago. Because we mandated two and three bedroom units, which you could have done on some of the projects I saw today, but didn't. And sure enough, you don't have kids in the neighborhoods. We use density bonusing and value capture and other tools to build daycare and schools. And we design the public realm to work for kids because if it works for kids, it works for everyone. And sure enough, the kids came. So the narrative that families don't want to raise their kids is a self in, in urban places is a self-fulfilling prophecy. But if you design for kids, they will come in numbers that will surprise you. So even this demographic group, is at least open-minded, if not predisposed, towards the kind of different suburbs and different cities that I talk about. So our downtown gets a lot of attention. And you're going to be, if you've grown up your whole life in Canberra, you're going to be shocked by the height. But this is what, in just one generation, we built between 1983 and 2003. I've got a similar slide, but it's just not as dramatic as this one uh, that shows the growth since then. But it shows what I like to say, that, that you can do a lot of good or a lot of damage in just one generation in a hot market, depending on the value system that drives your urbanism. But do not be distracted by the height. The issue is the quality of the urbanism. The reason why Vancouver gets so much attention for the way we do our tall buildings is we do our tall buildings differently. Frankly, we do our tall buildings better than you do. 
in every Australian city I've seen. A lot better. You don't do your tall buildings very well here. But the downtown gets almost too much attention because it's the rest of the city and the rest of the region. And I point out that's a success or failure of our cities and regions and ultimately our survival from the context of things like climate change are gonna depend on how well we do our suburbs because that's still where the majority of people live and where the majority of people are going. And when suburbia is this, we've got a problem. I don't equate all suburbia with sprawl. A suburb isn't automatically sprawl, but too much of it is. And yet I can, you can have a PhD candidate tell you what the definition of sprawl is. I've got a really simple one, auto dependency. And that doesn't mean the absence of other choices like transit, walking, and biking. But if you're looking at the transit route and you're thinking, God help anyone who has to take that bus, because it only comes every 45 minutes, if it comes at all, and it does this. Versus a, an actual enjoyable and reasonable option. If not, you live in sprawl. That sprawl, cars, this is in Gold Coast, this is what sprawl looks like. I'm not sure if this is easy, better or worse. It's got water. In Vancouver, this is how we've been rebuilding our suburbs. A series of mixed-use, high-density town centers in the suburbs. Compare this with your polycentric approach and the densities that you have. This is one of our first-generation transit-oriented developments. Ten minutes left. Uh, first generation transit, North American new, new urbanists come and study this because it was built about 25, 30 years ago. And frankly, there's not much actual transit oriented development actually built in North America and even less in Australia, except for some examples outside of Sydney. I like to joke that we wouldn't even approve this now. It's not nearly good enough, but, it, but it's still better than what's being built in most other parts of North America. As a comparison example, now, all of our SkyTrain stations, and that's our main form of uh, elevated light rail. It's not really light rail, but that's a, new, that's a detail. It's automated light, it's automated light rail. Uh, automated is a key thing, because it saves operating costs like crazy. Uh, we've been building, we put the stations where the low-hanging fruit was in the suburbs, which is the 1960s shopping centers, which are low density and surrounded by a sea of parking. So there's an example, this is in Brentwood. This is the design that was done. And the interesting thing is, you see those two ghosted towers in the back in the image up top? Only those, that's the next phase. Everything else is within the first phase. And everything else within the first phase was built not even where the shopping mall was. It's built where the parking lot was, which shows you how much space we've been wasting, not just us in Canada, you in Australia too. Another suburban shopping center, this is what's being built. So the, the, the shopping centers are turning themselves inside out, creating urban places and sprouting vertical villages or towers to create body heat on transit. This is right on Canada Line, which is the light rail system we built in time for the 2010 Winter Olympics that connected the downtown and the airport. So along the Canada Line, not all high-rise, that's at the primary stations. In between, the connective tissue is mid-rise. Six-story, four to six-story wood frame, which we've been doing in uh, Vancouver for a while. And you get this kind of mid-rise. We've been doing mid-rise in Vancouver, a lot of it, for a long time. We get too much attention for our high-rise. We actually do our mid-rise very well. We do every scale well because we put a lot of attention to the design of it. And we don't get fixated on the height. I talk about the power of what I call density done well, and I talk about it in the public eye. I created this slide when I was the chief planner of Vancouver, and I went out, I remember in one case, in a month and a half, I went to 52 community meetings talking about why the public sector, government, is going to talk about density. Because in the absence of government doing that, the narrative is, if you're talking about density, it must be land developers wanting to make more profit. Or, if a planner is talking about density, you must be in the pockets of developers. I've heard that a few times in my career. There are strong, compelling reasons why government, why the public interest is wrapped up in not just density as a numbers game, because you can do a lot of bad density when you're just focused on numbers, but well-designed density done well. All the various things, I won't go through them, that are public interest aspirations that density can achieve that lower densities can't. At the same time, 
Cities are st trying to go through an evolution towards, frankly, better planning from doing the wrong things. I, I call this slide the evolution towards between do doing the wrong thing and doing the right thing. And I actually added in the first, uh, the third um, step after my first visit working in Brisbane. You start off by doing the wrong thing. We've been doing a lot of wrong things. Suburbia sprawl is a fundamentally wrong thing. Then we put a lot of energy into what I call doing the wrong thing better. And there's a lot of cities that most of their progress, most of the things they're getting attention in, is actually in the category of doing the wrong thing better. Canberra, I would say, in terms of its original building, is an example of doing the wrong thing better. You are a better suburb. Instead of giving all the space to cars, you gave it to trees. You're better, but you are still spread out and sprawling. And it's very hard for anybody to get around except by car. So you're still doing the wrong, you did the wrong thing. You just did it better. I, I added in the, the step uh, about um, having your cake and eat it too, because Brisbane is putting a lot of money into walking and biking and transit. I should, a lot of money, it's still a rounding error in their budget. But they're still putting most of their money into car infrastructure. They're trying to have their cake and eat it too. You can't do that. The cities that are achieving mode shift which means less driving, more walking, biking, and transit, are not just starting things, they're stopping things. And the stopping things, stopping building, widening roads, is actually politically the harder part. But unless you're willing to stop doing the wrong things, it almost doesn't matter how many right things you start doing. It's a bit of an overstatement. I like right things. I actually give credit, by the way, for doing the wrong thing better. I always say, if you're gonna do the wrong thing, you might as well do it better. But never mistake that for the right thing. And use it as a conversation starter to say, okay, fine, that's an improvement on the wrong thing, but how do we get to where we really need to be? There's three aspects of density done well. First is the integration of land use and transportation. Too many places, and I suspect it's true here, still have the fragmented conversation, the silo thinking, where transportation is one conversation and land use is another. Uh, you probably, well, you did. You, you uh, in the 1960s, built wide roads and wide, wide highways, thinking that would solve congestion. It doesn't. It's now public knowledge. The engineers haven't been able to keep it secret, the law of congestion or induced traffic, as it's called. When you build more roads, more people drive, and they drive further and more often, so the roads fill up. We've known this since 1955, the great Lewis Mumford. Adding car lanes to deal with traffic congestion is like loosening your belt to, to cure obesity. I've never heard anybody say it better. And yet, we keep trying. We keep spending not just money, but a majority of our money on widening roads and building more roads and failing. In Vancouver, we never built freeways. We don't have any freeways. We're the only North American city that has no freeways within our municipal boundary. No major, only major North American city. This is where our freeways would have gone. Lobotomizing our waterfront, like they did the Brisbane waterfront, for example. You can imagine what I said to Brisbane about their waterfront highway. It wasn't the planners or the trans progressive transportation thinkers. It was the moms and the grandmoms in late 1960s and early 1970s that rose up and rejected the freeways. And now all the cool cities are tearing down their freeways. They're often using citing Vancouver because we're the only North American city that is actually succeeding in the measurements that engineers use to measure success. Reduce vehicle miles traveled or vehicle kilometers traveled, reduce commuting times. We're the only North American city that's heading in the right direction. And we're doing it by build, doing the opposite of what the engineers are building in other places. And cities are not just stopping building roads, using Vancouver as a model, but they're tearing down existing freeways. There's over 150 municipalities now that have turned them down, uh, using Seoul, Korea, for example, as an inspiration. The most important thing about this example is not the fact that this is an amazing new public space, that it's the number one tourist attraction in Korea. The most amazing and important thing about this is that the traffic got better. The narrative that this is somehow anti-car, that this is a Carmageddon scenario, a war on the car, is political bullshit or clickbait for the media. 
one or the other, take your pick. It's better for traffic. I can get into a whole reason about why, but I just don't have the time. My clients in Medellin, Colombia were burying the freeway. They couldn't get the freeway taken out because it's a national highway, didn't have the power. But we're burying it and putting the parks over top. My clients in Oslo, Norway, also burying their urban waterfront freeway, putting it on top, underneath a multi-modal corridor with density and use mix and community amenities. And in the corridor, light rail, separated bus lanes, separated bike lanes, and widened sidewalks. The highway still runs underneath. Guess which moves more people? This does. More people moved than in the highway underneath. Not more cars, but as soon as once you realize the actual job of mobility in a city is to move people, this works better. In Vancouver, we had, even though we had turned down the freeways, we had decades of what I called the years of the warlords. This is my one graphic, by the way, pretty impressive, right? We had years where engineers and planners were battling with each other for, suppression, for uh, supremacy at City Hall. It was the 1997 transportation plan that was the catalyst for a change in culture, not just policy, but culture. And it created what we now call the plan engineers. The engineers and the planners having a common definition of success to build a great city. We say, and the engineers say this too, not just the planners, that the best transportation plan is a great land use plan. If you get your land use right, then the infrastructure is possible for facilitating walking, biking, and transit. So when I was looking around Canberra today, yes, I was looking for separated bike lanes. Yes, I'm interested in the light rail system. But I was really looking at the land use transformations that either predate those um, infrastructure investments or may follow along with them. Because the land use is the more important part. It's the part you really have to get right. Because if you try to get multimodal through infrastructure, if you've gotten your land use wrong, you'll spend a ton of money and you'll fail. This is, in the transportation plan, the policy. Not balance. Balance is code for the status quo, only slightly better. Walking first, then biking, then transit, then goods movement, and then the car. We don't ban the car. We prioritize it last. So the many, many cities of the world that are working to go car-free in the center city, that's interesting. I find that very interesting. We don't do that in Vancouver. It's not necessary to ban the car if you completely reprioritize your thinking and prioritize the car last. The way I put it is, is if you design a city for cars, it fails for everyone, including drivers. If you design a multimodal city, it works better for everyone, including drivers. Again, this is not a war on the car. This is not an anti-car message. It works better for everyone, including drivers. Why? Because it's a space problem. Every public lecture I do, somebody says to me, but Brent, I have to drive. I can't give up my car. I said, great, keep your car. But it's better for you if she takes her bike to work and she walks and he takes public transit because they're all using less space and less public money and not fighting with you for the finite road space. If you're all trying to drive, none of you moves. The transportation plan we did in, the, in uh, 2012 uh, well, finished in 2012, I co-led this. It took the thinking to the next level. We had progressive engineers in Vancouver because they knew that streets were places to move people, not cars. But they still thought streets were places to move through. Whereas uh, the reason I wanted to co-lead this exercise is this, great, good streets, and by the way, that's Sydney. I actually use Sydney as uh, an illustration of this. Good cities know that streets are for people, not just cars. Great streets know that streets are places to linger and live in, not just move through. So how do you start to, be, to get into a place-making strategy for your streets, not just a movement strategy? I called it at the time sticky streets, the idea that the goal is actually to slow people down. Instead of, as the engineers were doing it, counting how many people you can move through the space as a definition of success. Walkability is about design. And it's not just about the horizontal. It's the vertical. We put most of our attention to the street wall, the city at eye level at five kilometers an hour, which is how the pedestrian perceives space. And you reward them by giving them something interesting, always interesting to look at as they walk. 
the most important urban design principle we have in Vancouver is no blank walls. Because blank walls kill pedestrian interest. Let's get past these. New York has done some of the best breakdown of this by looking at the different aspects of the urban street wall, breaking down the elements. What I don't know is how well they've been implemented. You know, in Vancouver, we didn't do anything nearly this well organized, and I've, I'm pretty impressed by this. But I do know that in Vancouver, we've been implementing. The question is, I don't know what New York's been doing. I'm interested in talking to them about it. This is an example I took in Brisbane, where that's the kitchen of a restaurant. And hopefully, there's nothing going on in there that makes you lose your appetite. But the idea is that you're creating a little bit of street theater instead of a blank wall. The most interesting thing about this example is that's a convention center. The convention center is usually the worst building in a city in terms of creating blank walls and turning itself inward. That's what they did at the edge of a convention center. So um, the second uh, priority is cycling. Uh, I won't get into this too much, but if you want to take urban biking seriously, you need to build more I've seen you have some examples, but you need to be a lot more, a lot faster, separated cycling infrastructure. Not on every street, but on every street that has high volumes and high speeds. Painted lanes won't do it. You will never get even close to 10% mode share, which we are, by the way, the first North American city to get to 10% bike mode share. We're in double digits, which is incredibly impressive for my fellow North American cities and gets a laugh when I work in Northern Europe. If you think bike lanes are easy in Vancouver and maybe hard in your city, this is a newspaper that routinely ranks just about everything in our city. Best use of taxpayers' money, bike lanes. Worst use of taxpayers' money, bike lanes. Incredibly polarizing, the last four mayoral elections have been fought on the issue of bike lanes and Carmageddon, and yet, We've been proceeding forward, even faster, thankfully, pulling the band-aid off faster, because it's working. It's successful. And, and our, our elected leaders showed bravery in the face of a lot of pushback, and we took the time to show that it works. Because sometimes you can't prove to people that it'll work until it's been built correctly and had some time to age. Let's see. So, um, once you realize that mobility, notwithstanding uh, some remarkable goals you have to go to renewable energy, I often say the, the key mobility challenge in cities is not about what comes out of the tailpipe. It's about space. This, I don't know if you've seen this drawing before, this is your prioritization. Generous space given to the single occupancy vehicle. Everyone else is crammed. Everyone else has a less than ideal experience. You've seen these kind of drawings before? I collect them. I'm up to about 150. Mayors send them to me because they know I tweet them. They're fun. And actually, we all know they actually underrepresent the space difference because this is what happens when they don't move. As soon as cars move, they take up way more space. But they're fun, and they make the point. And I'm big on things that go viral and help make the point and help people understand. In Sydney, this is how they did it. How do you move 1,000 people, one train, 15 buses, or 1,000 cars using 1.3 hectares of land for parking in the CBD? It's powerful. I like math. I used to hate math in school. Now I love math, as long as someone else is doing it, and I get to use it. So even um, uh, this is kind of fun. I don't see this much in Australia, come to think of it. And I, I, it's hard to find cities that don't have these now. Started in Buenos Aires, I think. But... Um, um, now um, are everywhere. When I'm working in other cities in Australia, we're talking about the missing middle, which is the housing forms. I called it gentle density when we did the eco-density exercise, which is ground-oriented densification up to about three or four stories. It's in between mid-rise and the single detached house. My, and this is my friend uh, Daniel Prolick in, in California called it the missing middle. Because it's, mis because it's underrepresented in our building. I called it gentle density because I wanted to make the point that it has low impact. It doesn't really change your neighborhood very much. The fascinating thing about Canberra is you have this. You just don't call it the middle. You call it the high density. So you're kind of 
You're miss, you've, got, you, you, you're, you've got a missing high instead of a missing middle. So a lot of, you know, I think Australian cities could come and study a lot of your ground-oriented densification. Some of it I, I thought was pretty well designed. Although I hear all of those are controversial because they're different yeah, locally. A lot of other Australian cities would kill for more of this kind of housing. Not instead of higher densities, but in addition to the transition, thank you, between uh, the low density and the high density. It's sort of a lot of cities in Australia and Canada are like pow and flat. You know, you're either flat or you're tall. In, in Vancouver, we did something called laneway housing. You would call these, I think, I think I heard you call them Fonzie suites here. I called them that when we were approving them in Vancouver. They're rear detached accessory units in the back of houses. Uh, either a side drive or uh, on a lane as we have them. We have over 2,500 of them approved since we changed the bylaws a few years back. So these small ideas can be powerful and it's rental housing which provides affordability. If you think density is an easy conversation in Vancouver, this is a poster that a NIMBY group did when we were proposing to change the height along an arterial, a bus, frequent bus network arterial from four stories to five stories. Good graphic skills, right? Pretty impressive. So the conversations are hard everywhere. And by the way, my NIMBYs are probably tougher than your NIMBYs because we've trained them to be incredibly astute planners. The youngest son of Jane Jacobs is a neighborhood activist in Vancouver and I, have to, I debate density with him all the time. You haven't had to debate against the son of Jane Jacobs. So your NIMBYs should, are just not that hard. I'm trying to get the conversation from NIMBY to Quimby. Quality, not NIMBY to YIMBY, not no to yes, but quality in my backyard. The conversation constantly about good design as opposed to just issues of height and such. Uh, the, the, I'm gonna end with just a, a few images that talk about the temporary city, what we call tactical urbanism, pop-up urbanism, lean urbanism, lighter, quicker, cheaper, as uh, the Project for Public Space call it. In the meantime, you've got a lot of gaps You've got a lot of open spaces. I learned more about filling gaps in my work in Christchurch than any other place because they lost 80% of their building stock in the earthquake. But you don't need an earthquake to realize you can fill gaps with temporary activation that makes more interesting places. So whether it's taking your parking spaces and turning them into parklets, um, uh, food trucks and food carts as an urban activator, container urbanism, which, which Christchurch did so well that now they want to make the container mall a permanent thing. This is Jutteberg, Sweden, Gothenburg, Sweden. It's a big, excessively big uh, surface parking lot. They created an edge condition as a night spot, a stacked container night spot. This is Brisbane, which took one of the worst corners in the downtown and made it one of the coolest corners in the downtown just by allowing something. So we can do a lot of things if we just give ourselves permission to that can almost immediately change the urban energy of our blank spaces and our dead spaces if we just lighten up a bit, what I call the city of smiles. And the truth is it doesn't take much money, but even if it did take much money, most cities don't have a budget problem. They have a prioritization problem. What I say is the truth about a city's aspirations isn't found in its vision, it's found in its budget. You're spending money on the wrong things. Thank you. Fantastic. Um, my name is Anthony Burton. I'm here representing uh, the Hart Foundation today, and uh, we're grateful hosts to, to Brent and really appreciate um, the energy and time that you put in, particularly given that your voice isn't so good today. So I'd, I'd hate to hear you when you, uh, when you have a good voice. Um, anyway, we've got time for a few questions, and I, and I, I see a few people here. Maria, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll come to you, and uh, Tony as well, and a, and a, and a few others. Um, uh, so, well, let's, let's just start with, with some questions. We've probably got about 15 minutes. Um. Yeah, Maria Fatsius, and I'm from the Inner South Canberra Community Council and a residence group as well. So I agree with you about Quimby rather than NIMBY. It's, the argument is all about quality. Uh, quality of design, and I was wondering, you, you said earlier that um, here in Australia we don't do tall buildings well, and I wondered whether, the, you know, how you do the nuts and bolts to get good quality hide buildings. Your predecessor, Larry Beasley, 
when he was here about a year ago, talked about design review panels and that any building has to go to a design review panel. So do you still have that system or how do you ensure good quality? Uh, yes, we have the oldest urban design panel in North America and it still is helpful. But frankly, it's a piece of a larger culture. From day one, I, like, I joked when I was chief planner that our data guy, the guy who know, does the numbers, understands urban design better than most Canadian planners and Cana uh, Canadian urban designers. It is embedded in our DNA because we trained ourselves, and I now help other cities get to that level of, of culture change around urban design, where yes, it is through tools like an urban design panel, but it's much more than that. Our tall towers are better because we've essentially married the, the advantages of a mid-rise, the podium, which creates a human scale, a sense of enclosure, a height to width ratio, if you understand the golden ratio back in very old urban design, that creates a walkable environment where the towers don't establish the relationship uh, of the pedestrian to, to the scale because the towers are two per block, they're separated, they're stepped back. As Larry put it, they float out of the perception of the walker. And it's the podium that establishes the human scale. So you literally get the best of both worlds. You get the human scale of the podium and the body heat that comes from people riding down their public transit system, the elevator, which I consider a public transit system, and they interact with their neighborhood and they support local schools and local shops, et cetera. So even people who are against tall buildings, like my good friend Jan Gale, uh, everybody know Jan Gale? Even Jan says, I'm not convinced cities should have tall buildings but if they do them, they should do them like Vancouver does. And our, our uh, podium and tower is actually the only picture in his book, Cities for People, of high rises. Because he understands what we've done, which is create a hybrid. But the key is, as I said, if all the conversation is about how many floors the building has, not how it expresses itself as a cap, as a center, how thin it is, how separated it is, to allow view corridors, to the mountains, views and light access, privacy between towers so you're not crammed in, and most importantly, how it lands in a way that strengthens the street and activates the street. That's how you get a good tower. My experience is you people have extremely myopic and superficial conversations about tall buildings because you just talk about how many floors it has. The other problem you have is that in many cases, the tall buildings are not approved by the local council. I know you guys have a different government structure here. In Melbourne, in Sydney, et cetera, uh, Brisbane, the tall buildings get approved by the state, and the smaller buildings get approved by the local council. Now, local councils aren't per perfect, but states have no idea how to approve tall buildings. So the tall buildings are the worst buildings in the city, which, by the way, makes people hate tall buildings. You know, what, what, often what I, I like NIMBYs. NIMBYs are people who are afraid of change and can teach me what they're afraid of. So I don't, and I can do a better job if I listen carefully. But I always tell people who don't like NIMBYs, you know, I have clients who say, how do we get rid of the NIMBYs? You don't get rid of NIMBYs. But I said, trust me when I say this, if you think NIMBYs are tough to deal with when they're wrong, let them be right. And they're right when you approve ugly tall buildings. The first time you let something crappy get built, the NIMBYs are right. And I would agree with the NIMBYs. If that's what I'm going to get, I don't like tall buildings either. So you need to have the culture, the design skills, the mechanisms, yes, like urban design panel, which is just a mechanism that doesn't give you a culture, uh, the skill sets, etc., to deliver quality consistently, or else you're going to have a hard time doing infill. You might get some good projects, but if for every good project you get two bad ones, why is anybody going to like height or density? Uh, so my question is, though, with the doubling of the freight tasks worldwide, but particularly in Australia in the next 15 years, how do you deal with... The doubling of the what? Doubling of the freight tasks. So we'll have twice as much freight being moved in Australian cities in the next 15 years. Okay. How do you manage the freight task mm. on, in the road network? Um, We've sort of designed our system a bit better here, but in, say in Melbourne, the last kilometre, there's enormous conflict. Land use, you know, delivering the Coles groceries at 2am in the morning. Mm. 
how do you manage that and say in Vancouver where you don't have a freeway network? Well, you noted that I'd, I had goods movement above the private car in our orientation. I f found an interesting hap thing happening lately where engineers who don't want to be part of the old way of thinking, they don't want to be the uncool kids, they've stopped talking about cars movement, but they've started talking about goods movement. And they're arguing for the same things, more roads and wider roads. But it's not for cars, it's for goods movement which is a bit of a lie. Um, the truth is, um, I think smart cities are realizing there's a timing thing, just like peak travel time for cars, you know, the morning commute, the evening commute, there's the when things get delivered. But what I found and what we're finding in Vancouver in the context of the transportation plan is that if you are successful in building a multimodal city, it creates more space for freight. Because if everyone's trying to drive, once again, uh, the trucks can't move either. So whether you give them dedicated lanes, which we've thought about but haven't done, or whether you just say, we're freeing up capacity for them by making sure that other people can get around in other ways. And you often see on our busiest streets, it isn't cars filling up the busy streets at times of the day, it's trucks. So that seems to be working. Um, I don't have a better answer for you than that, in the sense that that's an ongoing struggle, and it's one we respect, we're not flippant about it. But I found that the same solutions for multi-mobility are the ones that uh, support that kind of movement. The same failed solutions around multi-mobility, let's just build wider roads, etc., will not solve the problem of goods movement, because it won't be trucks that fill up those extra lanes, it'll be cars. Unless, of course, you have pricing mechanisms. You could have a whole conversation about pricing mechanisms. You could jack up the cost, you could make trucking free, jack up the cost of everything else, and you have free flow potentially for trucks. Which if you want to talk about congestion and in the context of wide roads, pricing mechanisms is the conversation. Uh, okay, thank you, Brent. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I'm Richard Hu from the Faculty of Arts and Design at this university. Uh, Definitely, Vancouver has a reputation for its urban design and urban form uh, internationally. I remember in 2008, I had a conversation with Alan Jacobs at Berkeley, and I strongly criticized North American cities and using Lo uh, Los Angeles as an as a example, and Alan recommended that Richard should go to Vancouver, and that I did. We're now, my be, question we're, is we're to check effect. <laughs> Uh, my question is to check the fact. In the last year, uh, the city of Sydney had a new central Sydney strategy, and one important initiative was to limit the residential development within 50% for major uh, buildings and uh, etc. And the Graham Yard, the planning director, said that we learned the best practice from Vancouver. So for me, uh, the dynamic downtown life in Vancouver is in part because of the, uh, the living population in the city rather than just the working population. So my question is, are you really doing that uh, policy that for me is very problematic to limit the first development of residential to, to, to leave the space for commercial development? Thank you. I'm glad Graham is giving Vancouver credit. I was their advisor on that. Um, they looked at our, what we called a Metrocore Jobs and Economy Strategy because we were the first North American city, because we were the first North American city to try housing downtown, which you have to understand was at a time where that was a crazy idea. No one will ever want to live downtown was the narrative back then. Because we were the first to do it, we were also the first to observe the problem associated with it. Larry, my predecessor, called it living first. The actual policy at the time was a complete city. But Larry, in his credit, realized that sometimes you have to emphasize what's missing, and what's missing was housing, until it catches up, right? In my era, we had more than caught up, and it was pushing out job space. We started to have conversions of office space to residential towers in the CBD and CBD shoulder area. And we passed a moratorium 
Plus, we were just seeing um, residential applications in the CBD. And the problem is, once you have residential applications in the CBD, you've kind of almost already lost. Because what that means is land is transacting at residential prices, which in Vancouver was about four times the, resident, the land value of an office tower. So we missed a whole seven-year office cycle where normally your vacancy rates and such would spur a construction phase of new office towers. We missed it because of the speculation that we would be able to do a residential tower instead of an office tower in the CBD. So we passed a moratorium on all office conversions or residential projects in the CBD. That was in 2004. And then it probably took us till 2010 to bring the MetroCore uh, strategy to council, which basically made that um, conversion moratorium permanent. You're, you cannot do residential buildings in the CBD or CBD, oh no, in the CBD. You can only do in the, under very limited circumstances where there is an existing heritage building, for example. Uh, you can do a hybrid in the CBD shoulder area of uh, mixed use, vertical mixed use, office and then residential above. But there's very few sites where that's gonna be allowed. And what happened, importantly, is then land started to price properly. And then a REIT uh, uh, or uh, another office provider uh, could come in and buy land at the proper price and build towers. And suddenly we had a boom of office space. So our, if you're asking me the question, it's very hard, yes. Did it work? Absolutely. It worked uh, at a building level that surprised us even. And we've had two, already two cycles of massive office space um, uh, projects. I'm currently right now as a consultant working on two significant office buildings in the downtown. And none of it would have happened had we not taken that approach to residential speculation. So Graham knew, had heard that we had gone through this exercise. I was already not chief planner anymore and he called me and I helped his staff uh, figure out a strategy for it. So I'm hoping it's working there too. It will work there if they actually do it. You have to be meticulous in your follow through because if you're wishy-washy, then land doesn't know what to price itself at and you miss an office cycle. That so makes sense? So we've probably got time for just one final very quick question if we can. Anne Forrest, uh, Inner South Canberra Community Council. I'll try to make it really quick. Um, you mentioned laneway housing. Mm. In this city, prior to self-government, uh, there were planning instruments that, in, that were going to encourage that in suburban areas, but self-government and the budget bottom line interfered with that. Um, I wondered if you had any views on, in this better, good urban design, uh, public housing, um, incorporated into that and you mentioned trees. You're not suggesting in our climate that we remove our trees in Canberra, are you? No. Okay, I'm not sure I fully understand the first two parts of your question. Um, and your comment about laneway housing when you said I think self-government and the budget cycle interfered with laneway housing, I don't understand that. Uh, I would say that probably politics interfered and maybe you're being diplomatic. Um, the, things like, I called it gentle, hidden and invisible density to make the point that these housing types are completely compatible and can be integrated into low density, single detached neighborhoods in a way that are either gentle in the form of terrace houses or even hidden because they're in behind or even invisible in the form of secondary suites within the primary house. They are all compatible. There is no parking problem. There is no planning problem. The only thing that holds cities back on this housing idea is politics. So if you want to build them, you need to get past your politics. We um, calibrated our strategy very carefully to, to make sure that they would survive not only the technical questions, but the politics as well. We addressed the parking 
questions. We addressed the height and overlook into people's backyards by making sure that it wasn't two primary levels, but one and a half and no windows overlooking. So we designed them carefully. We thought about and researched every reason that this idea failed in other places. As an example, in Seattle, 35 of them got built and then the program got canceled because people were calling them backyard towers because they were too big and there was an issue of privacy. We didn't have that problem because we didn't allow two full stories because we learned from what Seattle had done. So if, if you, you know what I ask cities is quit making excuses. Do you want this housing type or not? If you don't, then be honest about that. If you do, there are ways you can calibrate it to address all the issues and concerns, and then you can have a success similar to ours. But in most cases, it's just excuse is what I find. Now, your second question, uh, I've worked on some of the most controversial projects in North America that are renewal of, of public housing projects. They can be controversial for many reasons, one of which is there can be an awful lot of self-interest on the part of the existing residents to keep their nice suburban low density lifestyle, which is pretty nice in the context of uh, the rest of the city, which is changing. So, but I've also seen it done horribly and I've seen it done well in terms of working with the local community to even phase development in a way where people can stay on the site, and not be moved off and then have to be moved on. Look at the Regent Park project in Toronto. It's probably the best in Canada. Uh, as an example of that. But to me, it's an example of design. It's an example of strategic densification. And particularly in the context of low-income communities, it's about being really, really good at listening and learning and having a good engagement process. But that doesn't necessarily mean making the existing residents happy. They're not the only constituent in that conversation. And last thing I'll say is, no, you don't need to get rid of your trees. Um, I think it's a false narrative to say, do we either have trees or density? I think you can design for both, but you need artful design. You need to have a good culture of being able to design well. I'm not sure you have that. I don't know. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Brent. Thank you.